Hitler and all that Hitler stands for brought upon Europe and the world. It is upon this foundation that Hitler pretends to build out of hatred a new order for Europe. But nothing is more certain than that every trace of Hitler's footsteps, every stain of his infected and corroding fingers will be sponged and purged and it need be blasted from the surface of the earth. Lift up your heart. All will come right out of the depths of sorrow and of sacrifice will be born again the glory of mankind. said, I want violent, imperious young people. The free, magnificent beast of prey must once again flash from their eyes. I want strong and beautiful and athletic youth, unquote. Oh, friend, in this program, you're going to see things leading people to the second death just as surely as this dear man was led to the first. Welcome to part one of Roman Catholic Attack on God's Seventh-day Adventist Church. Right from the start, I want to remind you that as an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister, I'm standing in loyal defense of God's 6,000-year-old Seventh-day Adventist Church against the tremendous Roman Catholic attack going on against it. Does God want his people to know the plots of the devil and of the papacy? Listen to what God's prophet says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 118. I quote, All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power. The perils of the last days are upon us, and in our work we are to warn the people of the danger they are in." Unquote. Since this new series is built upon information in my 12-part series entitled Catholic Charismatic Attack on God's SDA Church, I want to remind you of some things that we've already learned before we learn new and shocking facts concerning this worldwide attack that is going on right now. Number one, we've learned that God's prophet has revealed to us in Great Controversy 565 and 566 
that Rome has three great goals today. Number one, to regain control of the whole world. Number two, to restart persecution. And number three, to undo all that Protestantism has done. Now, in my first 12-part series, I gave you a glimpse of how Rome is doing all three of those things. In that series, you saw, number one, a history of the Jesuits of Rome, their purposes, and their work. Number two, you learned some of the Roman Catholic strategy to regain control of the world. Number three, you saw an SDA woman who actually married a Jesuit priest not realizing what she was doing. And you found out what happened. Point number four, you heard a personal testimony given by a personal friend of mine giving an account of Jesuit infiltration of an SDA college by the professor of that very college who caught the Jesuit himself. Point number five. You saw and heard the SDA official who gave a medal to the Pope of Rome. Number six. You saw the 1,000 page Vatican II document in which the celebration movement was planned out for the churches 30 years ago. Point number seven. We've already learned and you saw and heard evidences that that very plan for that celebration movement is being carried out in the churches right now around this country and other countries of the world right before our eyes. Oh yes. This is to put the uh, members of the churches into such confusion and state of change that they will be more willing to accept the Roman Catholic principles into their own churches in this thrust for the Catholic takeover that was planned many years ago. Point eight. You learned about the subtle new forms of hypnosis called NLP. And you learned how many ministers and church leaders have actually uh, taken courses learning the principles of these things uh, not only to reach backsliders and bring them back, but also to put their own members in willful submission, just like the Catholics are in submission to their priests. You saw how all of this is in harmony with the plans of Rome to control the churches from their own hierarchies uh, without the members knowing that Rome has a thing to do with it. Point number nine, we've already learned that the ecumenical movement, the charismatic movement, the celebration movement are all movements instigated by Rome to help unite all of the major churches with her in a similar way that the male black widow spider unites with his wife before he's stung to death by her. Oh, friend. Point number 10. In part 3, you learned already of the Roman attack on the Protestant Bible and the production, the propaganda, and the greatest media blitz to trick most seminary ministers in most denominations to use the greatest essential Jesuit Bible in the world today, the N. IV. Oh yes, friend. And I want to tell you right now that not only did you learn the plots of the devil, you saw the lovely Jesus uplifted, his cross, his blood for you and me, his love, his mercy, his grace. And you learned that the cross of Jesus was uplifted and the truth of the lovely Jesus was uplifted in such a way as to strengthen and encourage God's faithful Seventh-day Adventist people against the great Catholic attack going on in our world today. Yes. Point number 11. You learned the success 
of the great Catholic celebration movement in the main churches today with the rock music, with religious words, uh, dancing in the ch uh, churches, in the aisles, uh, bringing in an imbecile mentality by the dear church leaders, and the actual formation of papal hierarchies with innocent and godly people being illegally disfellowshipped, whole churches being illegally disbanded, a whole conference being illegally disbanded. Oh, friend. And you learn that about the, the suit, lawsuit in the court by a papal hierarchy, which, by the way, is no curse to those who get sued under those conditions. Point 12. We've already learned of the mighty power of our mighty God and how He is moving through His faithful and humble Seventh-day Adventist people around this world to thwart the devil, to draw close to the lovely Jesus and reach thousands of precious souls with God's powerful three angels' messages. You saw with your own eyes the bishop of the apostolic denomination who reported that about 300 of their apostolic churches switched to keeping God's holy Sabbath after their bishops read a book entitled National Sunday Law. Friend, now we're going to go on a journey behind the scenes. We're going to take a shocking glimpse. We're going to go on a dangerous journey. And I don't know if there's going to be a part two of this program. I don't know if I'm going to be alive that long. I don't know if you're going to be alive that long. But whether I live or die won't make much difference as long as you keep getting God's last warning message of love out to the dear people, as long as you keep giving them Bible studies, as long as you keep talking and praying with them and keep getting the Sunday law books out to them on doorsteps, phone booths, benches, bulk mailing. If I'm dead, you can get them from my wife, sweet Vanita. Now, I just pray that this program will inspire you to draw closer to God than ever in your life, to reach more precious souls for Him than ever in your life. And so, friend, now we're going to go on this deep journey, this deep study, learning more of this shocking Roman Catholic attack than ever before. It started in modern times, back in the year 1929, in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, when the deadly wound of the papacy began to be healed at the signing of the Lateran Pact between Mussolini and the Pope. In the book, book called Vatican Policy in the Second World War, which you're looking at right now, by L. H. Lehman, he said, quote, Lewis Mumford was one of the few Americans who discovered that the Second World War began with the signing of the Lateran Pact between the Pope and Mussolini in 1929. In his book, Faith for Living, page 160, he says, quote, Political interpreters have set various dates for the beginning of the fascist uprising against civilization, but most of them go back no further than 1931. This is a curious blindness, the betrayal of the Christian world, very plainly, took place in 1929, in the concordat that was made between Mussolini and the Pope, unquote. Friend, in that very year, the papacy began in earnest her plans to regain control of the whole world in harmony with the prediction made by the prophet of God in the great controversy 565. Now, friend, you're going to see that after Mussolini gave back power to the Pope, the Vatican immediately started putting into effect 
the devil's plan for Rome to regain control of the whole world so Satan could have more power and better organization to put God's people to death. Oh, yes. Satan's girlfriend named Rome chose three agents. Number one, the Japanese emperor to conquer a certain part of the entire world. People not knowing that Rome had anything to do with it. But you're going to see soon that soon after the signing of the pact with Mussolini, some years later, the uh, Vatican had that very Japanese emperor come to the Vatican, visit the Pope, and they had an agreement together before Japan ever attacked Manchuria on her journey. Uh, number two, Mussolini in Italy. Vatican uh, planned to use that man, man number two, to help regain another part of the world for Rome. And number three, Adolf Hitler. The plan was for the leaders of Japan, Italy, and Germany to move around the world like a great machine, like a great colossus. As agents of Rome, they would meet in one place on the globe eventually. All of their attacks and their taking over would lead to one nation. The culmination of the taking over of one nation which Satan hates. One nation which Rome hates because it is a center for missionary activity around the entire world. It was the place of the beginning of God's visible remnant church on this earth in modern times. They would have a message going around the world to undermine the cause of Rome and of the devil himself. This one nation would have no king, it would have no pope, but would give liberty and justice for all. The nation, the United States of America. Oh yes, friend. In this program, friend, you're going to see how this great nation, the United States, has played a part in what is going on. You're going to see how Rome has sought to attack that nation and that church, the church of the living God in that nation. Yes, we're going to see some wonderful things. In this program, we're going to give you more of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Great Controversy 565 that Rome would seek to regain control of the whole world. And in that context, we're going to see the part that the great Roman Catholic institution has played in attacking God's Seventh-day Adventist Church today. Oh, yes. My first 12-part series, which you should have watched before seeing this program, you have already seen 24 hours of documentation of this great Catholic attack. But friend, the mountain of evidence against Rome is so gigantic that even 24 hours of documentation, plus this series on top of that, which is even stronger, is only a tiny bit like a grain of sand on a vast beach compared to all the evidence of what Rome is doing. Yes, only in eternity will you know the whole story as the voices of millions of martyrs cry for vengeance upon their tormentors. Oh, friend, God will not always allow it to be thus. The lovely Jesus is going to do something. He's going to do something. So, in the scope of this program, we're not going to look at the vast amount of information concerning Rome's use of Japan and Italy in her uh, attempt to regain control of the world, but we're going to zoom in on that third power. We're going to zoom in on that third man, that man who was a leader of that power of the country of Germany. We're going to zoom in on him, the son of Rome, by which the Jesuits and papal officials worked under their master the devil to help take the world for Rome, to help to eventually try to stop 
the promulgation of God's three angels' messages and to eventually try to put God's people to death. The man's name, Adolf Hitler. He was born here in Brownell. Adolf was baptized in the Roman Catholic fashion and was raised as a Roman Catholic. At the age of six, he entered the monastery school at Lombard and was top of his class. Hitler sang in the choir at the great Abbey Church of Lombard. He said, quote, I used to intoxicate myself with the solemn splendor of the services. Every day when he sang in the choir, he saw an emblem which a quarter of a century later he would adopt for the Nazi party. There on the wall in the Catholic Church he saw the swastika. In his teens he was moody. His ambition was to go to Vienna and become an artist or architect. He made beautiful paintings but was not good enough to be accepted into the Viennese Academy of Fine Arts. He became a drifter and for three years lived in the home for homeless men. In Munich, Germany in 1914, a crowd gathered at the outbreak of World War I. On the right is a photographer, and in the crowd that he is photographing is the 25-year-old Adolf Hitler. This was the turning point in his life as he waits to enlist as a soldier. He discovered in war a sense of distorted purpose he did not find in peace. He didn't know it, but already the devil was training him to be a future agent for Rome. Not knowing the lovely Jesus from his Roman Catholic training, he had no peace of mind. He joined a small group of fanatical nationalists in Munich, and they became the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazis. He led an uprising down the streets, was arrested, put in jail, and at the trial he told his judges, quote, History will tear to tatters the verdict of this court, unquote. It is claimed that he dictated much of the text of his book, Mein Kampf, from his cell. We learned in the 12-part Catholic Charismatic series that you've already seen that the Jesuits actually wrote much of it for him. Hitler had received a degree of popularity from his first failed attempt to take power, and now Rome would start to use him as her faithful son. But his power, which he would exercise in the future, would not be so much from his book as from his mastery of the spoken word. Diesem Deutschland bin du. Wir sollten Deutschland in stolzer Freude. Hitler's opportunity to strike came as a result of the poverty brought on by the depression of the 30s, which you already learned that Rome had helped to instigate. We've also already learned that Rome can take control much better amid poverty and mental chaos. This is one reason why Rome is trying even now to trick the denominations into ordaining women. They did it with the Episcopalians. And you learned that not only did much support drop off for them financially, but many church members and even a bishop took his whole church and became... Roman Catholics. Oh, friend, who tricked these dear men into voting on that issue? Was it the agents of Rome? Amid the poverty, the democratic parties gave no solution to millions of Germans. The only hope was Adolf Hitler. They didn't know it. But the solution had been manipulated, and by choosing him, they were choosing a representative of Rome. With the Jesuit SS, the devil 
and death. A month after he comes to power, the Reichstag building, the Parliament building in Berlin, was burned down, and before that night was over, Hitler had drawn up a set of decrees which swept away freedom of the press, freedom of speech, many freedoms under the plea of protecting the people from terrorism, from communism, just like a similar trend has now been set on foot in the United States after the great bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City and other similar acts of terrorism by other agents of Rome seeking to do in this country now what she sought to accomplish in Europe in Hitler's day in fulfillment of great controversy 565. His decree led to the burning of so-called immoral books. One book, which was burned, said, quote, when people start burning books, it's not long until they start burning people. Most Germans tolerate the burning of books and the setting up of a police state because Hitler offers a way out of the economic hard times. The people of the United States will also soon tolerate a similar situation and the bringing in of the national Sunday law for similar reasons. Why, just today, on NPR Radio News, after the terrorist bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City, the president has approved uh, the army investigating what they believe to be terrorist groups in the United States. Oh, friend, just today, on NPR Radio News, it is reported that chain gangs have now come back to the United States permanently. Chain gangs have now come back permanently to the United States. Most people interviewed uh, in the area have approved the old measure, chain gangs, in which those who violated the Sunday laws of the 1800s were punished, including a number of Seventh-day Adventists. And these people interviewed said that it's a good way to get tough on crime. Just today on USA Radio News, the present administration in Washington, D.C. said it is pushing hard for its beefed-up anti-terrorist plan in the wake of the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Friend, could it be similar in the future to the anti-terrorist plan put out in Germany 50 years ago? secretly arming the country to the teeth, soon to try to help conquer the world for his mother, Rome. Tens of thousands of youth were attracted to Hitler because he gave them a vision, something to look forward to and work to do. Oh, friend, do ministers today give youth a vision, something to look forward to and work to do? Do you? Do I? Rome does. Hitler expresses his tender love for them. He tells them that he would bring peace when he is planning war. To... Und ich weiß, das kann nicht anders sein. Denn ihr seid Fleisch. 
von unserem Fleisch und Blut, von unserem Blut. Und in euren jungen Gehirn brennt dasselbe Geist, der uns beherrscht. Vor uns liegt Deutschland, in uns marschiert Deutschland und hinter uns kommt Deutschland. To those prepared to ignore or justify the police state, it seemed a beautiful Germany, just like those who are prepared to ignore today or justify the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA Church. November 1938, Hitler organizes a great anti-Jewish program called the Night of the Broken Glass. All through Germany, Jewish synagogues are burnt, Jewish shop windows are broken, just like will happen soon to faithful Seventh-day Adventists. That's when the foolish virgins will make their cowardly selves known by also turning against their own fellow SDA church members, just like the citizens betrayed one another in Hitler's day. Thousands of Jews were arrested Thousands more immigrate. German people stand around to see stormtroopers attack the houses of their Sabbath-keeping neighbors, just like they will in the near future when the National Sunday Law comes. Well, when the stormtroopers came, they entered the house uh, screaming aloud, Judah, Verrecke, raus mit den Juden and they entered the flat of the Goldbergs and threw their piano out of the window. They threw a typewriter out of the window and they smashed the furniture inside their flat. I um, uh, didn't understand the world anymore. Uh, I asked my mother, why are these men doing such things? And she told me, don't worry, they are Jews anyway. And I said, well, are there other uh, kind of people? And she said, yes, they are like uh, vermin in the larder. Oh, friend, listen to what the prophet of God says concerning these last days and what will happen to Sabbath keepers, similar to what you just saw. I quote, as the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Quote, Thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 5 to 7, as quoted in Great Controversy, page 615 and 616. Would you like to be given a hint of the way lawmakers will talk in the future as they talked concerning the lovely Jesus and concerning the Sabbath keepers 50 years ago? Ich will heute wieder ein Prophet sein. Wenn es dem internationalen Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, Dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die deutsche Regierung der Erde und damit das Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. As soon as Hitler's Nazi regime came to power, the Vatican was the very first sovereign power to enter into formal negotiations with it. As quoted in this book, Vatican Policy in the Second World War by L. H. Lehman, Page 27, I read, quote, Franz von Papen, co-signer with Pope Pius XII of the Vatican's Concordat with Hitler's Reich, 
summed up the Vatican Hitler policies as follows, quote, The Third Reich is the first power which not only recognizes, but puts into practice the high principles of the papacy, unquote. Oh, friend, following the Jesuit plan of infiltration to soften up their victims, to keep them from uniting, Hitler said, quote, Demoralize the enemy from within by surprise, terror, sabotage, assassination. That is the war of the future, unquote. Adolf Hitler. For the softening up process, he sent his agents all over the world, disguised as tourists, students, businessmen, to bribe, threaten, and start local fascist parties until the day that they would make Hitler's attack easy. These subversive organizations provoked riots in different countries targeted by Hitler and Rome, just like Catholic agents did in the U.S. in the 1960s. Hitler's infiltrators created scenes like these in France. And scenes like these in Belgium. And where do you think this is? Why, it's in Madison Square Garden in the U.S.A., hiding behind the American flag. Oh, friend, what about now? Would Rome also have agents to help soften up churches today as well as nations? church which you just saw containing the IHS sign the Jesuits use is the same church which put pressure on the conference to ordain women. I've written a paper concerning what the Bible says on that subject in my mid-May monthly letter. If you don't already have one, just ask and write to the address at the end of this program. Would Rome use the same techniques today to soften up churches for Rome's attack? as was used 50 years ago to soften up nations for Germany's attack? Could Rome get away with telling SDA church members that Peter is the rock? If she did, would anyone protest? Or has Rome's attack gone so far that they would drink it in? Could an agent of Rome also challenge SDA church members to go to church on Sunday? giving a good reason? If so, would anyone protest? Or would they drink it in? You're about to see a man 
tell SDA church members that Peter is the rock. And you're going to see what the SDA church members do. You're about to hear the same man challenge them to go to church on Sunday. This same man is the pastor of the same church that put pressure on the conference to ordain women. This same man is the pastor of the same SDA church which had the IHS logo the Jesuits use. This same man is the man you saw in my CCA video series number 4 and 8 teaching SDA pastors to teach their members hypnotic Christian meditation who said, quote, we hypnotize them. This same man was the teacher of the class which used the Roman Catholic textbook and taught the hypnotic Christian meditation in which the SDA girl you saw on CCA video number 8 became a devil-worshipping witch. Oh, friend, would you ever live long enough to see the Roman Catholic attack on God's SDA church in which a man would do these things and say these things in the largest membership SDA church in the world? Watch closely. From the Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 940. The Lord purifies the heart very much as we air a room. We do not close the doors and windows and throw in some purifying substance, but we open the doors and throw wide the windows and let heaven's purifying atmosphere flow in. Very abstract. Very abstract. The windows of heaven, the windows of impulse, of feeling must be opened up toward heaven and the dust of selfishness and earthliness must be expelled very abstract what in the world does that mean I mean you know <laughs> theobabble the grace of God must sweep through the chambers of the mind. I mean, that sounds like a Buddhist talking, doesn't it? There's a real mystic in action right there. You know, the grace of God must sweep through the chambers of the mind. What in the world does that mean? I mean, hey, give me something solid, man. Don't give me that mystical body stuff. That's Adventism's best known mystic in action. Abstract meditation is not enough. Busy action is not enough. Both are essential. That sounds like St. John of the Cross speaking now. Same kind of language. Or William Johnston from Sophia Seminary in Tokyo. Or Morton Kelsey from his desert retreat in Arizona. I like to sit rather than lie when I meditate. Uh, pews are awful, but uh, they're the best we have. You can't drop your hands at your sides. You can't do the tense and relax exercises to get ready for meditation with pews. But we don't expect anything to happen in church anyway. That's why we have pews. <coughs> I like to put my feet out on my heels and then bring them back so they're kind of at the minimal where there's any weight that I can kind of imagine in my mind if I wanted to that I'm floating. I can actually almost feel like I'm floating. We need to teach our people how to do what I'm doing with you now in church. If I can do it in the university church with 3,500 people sitting there jammed together elbow to elbow, you can do it in your church regularly. They have a difficult time with a lot of this. 
and we need to teach them how to work with it. And the only time we have them at our, at our command, in a sense, we're going to hypnotize them, They're suggestible people. The only time we can do that is on Sabbath. That's when they're together. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chancel Ringers. It's okay to clap. But he was, he was kind of the, the willful leader of the flock on the day of Pentecost who stands up to preach, represent the disciples, Peter. When it came time for Peter to die, the tradition has it, a strong tradition, that Peter requested that he be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to suffer as his Lord had suffered. Strong, willful fellow. Now you take those constituents, this, the intellect that he had, the ability to ask questions, the ability to see, see beyond uh, superficial uh, platitudes, the ability to, to make a judgment together with, his, with emotional strength and color and his will. You have all of the constituents there for a magnificent human being, but Peter was still very weak. He wasn't a magnificent human being yet. Now, we want to turn from him. That's just kind of a thumbnail sketch of the kind of person he was. Aggressive, outspoken, bright, and willful. One of the 12 physicians. We want to look at how Jesus de deals with him. This is the second study in a series dealing with Jesus, the clinician. How does he deal with people and with circumstances? How does Jesus deal with this complicated, gifted, complex human being? Well, it starts when Jesus calls him. The first scene is in John, the first chapter, the Gospel of John. In the 31st verse of chapter 1, and it's subheaded Jesus' first disciples. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples, and when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. This is John the Baptist now. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Now here's Andrew, the brother of, of Peter, who was one of these following John and heard John say this. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that John had said and followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. What's the first thing Jesus does? He looks at him. Not just a glance, a penetrating look. One of those looks like you look right through somebody, a studied look. And then Jesus says to Peter, I know you, and I know your father. You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, or Rock, Peter, Rock. And that's the first meeting. What does Jesus do? He reaches out, and he takes this man and accepts him. He believes in him. He sees in him real talent and potential to be a follower of his. I know you, and I know your father, and you're a rock. You're going to make it. I believe in you. Now that's Jesus' method with this person. He reaches out and he says, I believe in you. If parents would say to their children, instead of why did you spill the milk, I believe in you. If parents say to their children, why did you come in drunk, 
I believe in you. When parents, if parents, if all of us as parents could learn to say to our children, I believe, children who grow up being told they're not going to make it, somehow they're flawed, somehow they're this, somehow they're that. Husbands and wives who tell each other, you're not going to make it, you don't measure up, you're not good enough. Friends who tell each other, you're not a friend of mine anymore. Jesus reached out, the master clinician reached out and said, I believe in you. You're going to make it, Peter. Right now, you're a flawed product, but you're going to be a rock. Jesus is burdened because he isn't sure any of them understand who he is and what his ministry is. So he takes the 12 physicians off to Caesarea Philippi, off into another part of the country where there aren't a lot of Jewish believers and a lot of Jewish rabbis and scribes and Pharisees, people to persecute him. Even at the time where they were planning his death in Jerusalem, but he was in, in another part, up, up in, in, in pagan land. There was a big temple up there, a mar, white marble temple dedicated and created by Caesar. There were ruins of other temples, and it was a, a quiet place, and Jesus had a couple of questions. He was concerned. I'm about ready to check out of here, and I'm not sure these guys have been following me now for two and a half years understand what's going on. I'm not understand I'm not sure anybody understands. So he pulls him aside and he looks at him and he says, Hey guys, tell me what are the people saying about me? Oh, Master. Some are saying you're John the Baptist, some are saying you're Elijah, and some are saying you're Jeremiah. And then he looks at the twelve and says, Who do you say I am? Well, they start kicking the dirt. And Peter, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. <laughs> very, very clear. And Jesus turns to him and says, only heaven could help you understand that. Blessed are you, Simon. And I tell you that you are Peter. You are the rock. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you power to open the gates of salvation to people. Look what happened in the day of Pentecost when Peter preached. 3,000 people plus were baptized. It would be better sometimes if Christians kept quiet when they try to explain the gospel to unbelievers. When they try to explain how people are saved, how human beings are, are saved and how salvation comes to us. It would be far better if many of us kept quiet until we knew ourselves and for ourselves. And we come, came to it on our own as Peter had to come to it. Never, Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus did something very interesting. He looked at him again. Oh, that look. 
Jesus said, Peter, Satan, get behind me. And Jesus was thinking of his temptation when Satan came to him and said, look, if you just bow down to me, all of this will be yours. You can do all of these things. He heard the voice of temptation in Peter, and he said, Peter, get behind me. Don't tempt me. Don't tell me to turn from what I have just explained to you I have to do. And he goes on to Jerusalem. He goes into a trial. And Peter is outside, and John the Beloved finds a seat for him. All the seats were taken in the courtroom. It's like the OJ trial. Yeah. Special pass to have a seat. All the seats were taken. Finally, John, Dr. John, physician John, goes out, finds a seat for, for Peter, and and brings him in. And then at the end, to demonstrate very clearly that he wasn't part of this party, he utters a string of oaths. And what does Jesus do? Oh, he looks at him again. There is that look. Can you see the picture? In the court, Peter, out of hearing, he thinks, has proved to everybody around that he's a rough sailor from the coast, a fisherman. And Jesus quietly turns and looks at him. The Bible says Peter rushed out of the place, weeping into the darkness. Jesus is crucified, resurrected. And who does he appear to? Alone, one-on-one. -on -one. Peter. Oh, would I love to have a transcript. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his death. And what did he say to Peter? Hey, rock, feed my lambs. With the keys that I have given you, open up salvation. Peter said, what? Hey, rock, feed my lambs. With the keys that I have given you, open up salvation. Jesus looked at him again. <laughs> There's that look. Feed my lambs. Let me, let, me, let me challenge you. Tomorrow morning, get up and dress and by yourself, even if you're married, go by yourself. That's a better way to do it. Just drive down the street and pick out a church and go there. Just walk in and be aware of how it feels there, how friendly it was and, and how warm and inclusive it was. See, I, I do that regularly. I go to church on Sunday often. Oh, friend, who is this dear man? Who is the pastor of the largest membership university SDA church in the world? Who is this dear man? Who was the president of Columbia Union College? Who is this dear man? Who was the president of the Pennsylvania Conference? Oh, friend, who is this dear man who taught the SDA ministers and conference officials as you heard in a workers' meeting, 
the spiritualistic and hypnotic meditation techniques and told them that they were going to hypnotize the SDA church members. Who is this dear man who while teaching the class on Christian meditation at CUC, the girl became a witch and started worshiping the devil until she was expelled from the college. Who is this dear man whom you heard upholding Peter as the rock which teaching the Roman Catholic Church is dependent upon to maintain their authority? Who is this dear man whose church choir had the sign on their choir robes that the Jesuits use? Oh, friend, who is this dear man who encouraged many to keep quiet about their faith but to go to church on Sunday, the pagan and Roman Catholic day whose enforcement will be the mark of the beast. Oh, friend, who is this dear man? Oh, friend, because of the spiritual condition of God's dear people, would he allow them to be attacked by agents of Rome or Assyria? Or would he allow them to be in bondage in Egypt to purge them and so that his deliverance of them might be more marked? Moses, with his flocks of sheep in the wilderness, pondered upon the oppressed condition of his dear people and his prayers for Israel ascended by day and by night. And it came to pass, the Bible says, in process of time, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant. And God looked upon the children of Israel and had respect unto them. O oh, friend, the Bible tells us that our mighty God had respect unto his dear people. The time for Israel's deliverance had come. But God's purpose was to be accomplished in a manner to pour contempt on human pride. Uh, God did not want man to take the credit. And today, it's the same thing. Today, friend, you've been seeing some of the Catholic attack on God's SDA church. God, again, is going to deliver his dear people, but in a way that, again, is going to pour contempt upon human pride. You just watch, friend, and in the near future, you're going to see our mighty God, what he's going to do to save his people. The deliverer was to go forth as a humble shepherd with only the rod in his hand, but God would make that rod the symbol of his power. God's 144,000 in the near future will be very humble, but will also be a symbol of God's power. God is going to use his dear people to put the pride of man in the dust again in our day. Oh, friend, I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? The prophet of God told us that since 1844, we've been retreating back into Egypt. Now, spiritually, many have arrived. But as in the day of Moses, God will soon deliver his faithful SDA people. As there were plagues there, so there are going to be plagues again. This time, the seven last plagues. Oh, friend, we need to be prepared. You need to be ready. You need to get your, your family ready, your children, your loved ones. Do all that you can because this thing is coming sooner than people think. With his brother Aaron, Moses went in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, 
Let my people go. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Exodus 5, verse 2. Oh, friend, Pharaoh's anger was kindled at the thought that already an interest was excited among the Hebrews and that they might be set free. And so he said, quote, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you into your burdens? Behold, the people of the land are now many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. Moses had shown his people that obedience to God was the first condition of deliverance and the efforts made to restore the observance of God's holy Sabbath had come to the notice of the Egyptian oppressors. Now the king was thoroughly roused. He suspected the Israelites of a design to revolt from his service. This affection was the result of idleness and he would see that no time was left them for any dangerous scheming. Now watch carefully what happens. That same day, orders were issued that rendered their labor still more cruel and more oppressive. The king now directed that no more straw be furnished. Uh, they must find it themselves, while at the same time, the amount of brick must not lessen. This order produced great distress among the Israelites. Can you imagine how you would feel if something like that happened to you? just like the laws will be coming to God's dear people and against them in the near future, when the national Sunday law is passed, when they lose their jobs, when many of God's people are reported by fellow church members and go to jail, when some are murdered for Christ's sake, and when some are made slaves. Oh, friend, already... Did you know that in this country already chain gangs have come back? Chain gangs, yes. Already slaves, chains. And God's prophet tells us that there will be slaves. There will be slaves. Time, friend, now is very, very short. Chain gangs have come back. You know what's going on. You know already many Sabbath keepers have been murdered in this very country. And whatever, friend, you're going to do for God to reach the dear people, you need to do it now. The Hebrews found it impossible to accomplish the usual amount of labor. And for this, the Hebrew officers were cruelly beaten, just like many faithful Seventh-day Adventists will be in the near future after the Sunday law comes. These officers went to Pharaoh with their complaint. They were ordered back to their work with the declaration that their burdens were in no case to be lightened. Returning from Pharaoh, they met Moses and cried out to him and Aaron, The Lord judge upon you. The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have put a sword in their hand to slay us. Oh, friend, as Moses listened to these reproaches, he was greatly, greatly distressed. He said, Lord, why hast thou sent me in thy name? God told him, now wilt thou see what I will do unto Pharaoh. The Egyptians, being informed of what was taking place among the bondmen, derided the expectations and scornfully denied the power of their God just like they're going to do in the near future when the Sunday law comes, friend. They pointed to their situation as a nation of slaves. And they tauntingly said, if your God is just and merciful and possesses power above that of the Egyptian gods, why does he not make you a free people? This will be said again, friend, to you and to me after the soon coming National Sunday Law. And friend, I'm not joking. Just before Jesus comes, this will happen again to you and me. Friend, if you've ever studied the Word of God in your life, the Bible, 
You need to study it now. You can see that, can't you? Oh, yes. Friend, if you've ever read the book also, which I've written entitled National Sunday Law, I'll say that if you've never written it, you can call the number on your screen right now, and I'll be glad to send you a free copy of it. Yes, the book called National Sunday Law tells exactly what's going to be happening in the near future. Now, the case of the Hebrews appeared very much like the Egyptians had represented. It was true that they were slaves, and they must endure whatever their taskmasters chose to inflict upon them. Their children had been hunted and slain, just like some of yours are going to be after this law comes. Their own lives were a burden, just like some of yours will be in the near future. Yet, they were worshiping the God of heaven. The God that they were telling the Egyptians made the whole world. If Jehovah were indeed above all gods, surely they thought he would not thus leave them in bondage to idolaters. Friend, you may be wondering right now, if the God of heaven is all-powerful, why would he allow the Roman Catholic attack on God's SDA church today? But friend, those of you who are true to God understand that just like they do today, it was because of Israel's departure from God and their disposition to unite with those who did not fear him, that God permitted them to become bondmen, just like some of you are already in the Catholic charismatic attack, already to Catholic charismatic new theology preachers. Some of you may know what I mean. Yes, slavery is coming again. All of these things will come again, especially when this national Sunday law is passed. Friend, here's the secret. Here's the secret of this whole thing. It's found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 260. I quote, The Hebrews had expected to obtain their freedom without any special trial of their faith or any real suffering or hardship, but they were not yet prepared for deliverance. It's the same today, friend. It says they had little faith in God and were unwilling, unwilling, patiently to endure their afflictions until he should see fit to work for them. Many were content to remain in bondage. Again, I'll say it's the same today. Friend, many today are willing to remain in a bondage of sin in this great Catholic attack. As I've showed you in the first 12-part series of this program. Now we're in part one of an even stronger program called Roman Catholic Attack on God's SDA Church. And again, I say, friend, today many are willing to remain in bondage right now. And you know what I'm talking about. The prophet goes on and says, And the habits of some had become so much like those of the Egyptians that they preferred to dwell in Egypt. As you know, it's the same today, spiritually. Therefore the Lord did not deliver them by the first manifestation of his power before Pharaoh. He overruled events more fully to develop the tyrannical spirit of the Egyptian king. And also to reveal himself to his people, just like he's going to do again, friends, in the near future. If you're alive, friend, you're going to see it. And it won't be long. You're not going to have to live long to see not only the oppression of God's people, like in Egypt, but also the mighty power of our God. Yes, after God shows his justice, his power, his love, then God's people back then would choose to leave Egypt just like they will in our day. 
and give themselves totally to God's service. The task of Moses would have been much less difficult had not many of the Israelites become so corrupted that they were actually unwilling to leave Egypt. Oh, friend, isn't it the same today? Oh, yes. So we see our kind and loving God allowing His people to suffer in the days of Moses and in the near future that they may fully appreciate the great deliverance to be wrought for them from the plagues and cling to their Savior and friend, our kind and loving God is going to also allow us to suffer. He is not going to deliver us after the first of the plagues like He did not deliver His people back then after the first of the plagues. That not only they but we also may fully appreciate the great deliverance to be wrought for us from those plagues to come and cling to the lovely Jesus as our Savior. Now in the time of Moses, every punishment rejected by Pharaoh would be followed by one more severe until his proud heart would be humbled and he would acknowledge the maker of heaven and earth although it was too late to save him. At first it was hard on God's people and the Egyptians mocked their faith friend just like it's going to be hard on us today in the near future and the Sunday the keepers are going to mock our faith too but keep in mind the parallels keep in mind the power of God is coming keep in mind the purpose of God keep in mind friend the love of God for you and it'll make it much easier when the plagues fell they were not mocking any more but trembled before the mighty God of Israel friend just like that in our day after the soon coming Sunday law and it will at first be hard on God's people as the Christian world will be mocking them just like in Egypt and you know they can't buy or sell it will be hard upon them many will be as slaves which you, they already have chain gangs now uh, many of them will be thrown in prison finally even many will be murdered it will be hard on God's people at first just the way it was hard on God's people then at first but when the plagues fell those who received them are not mocking anymore by the plagues God would punish the people of Egypt for their idolatry and silence their boasting of the blessings that they were supposed to have received from their senseless deities God would glorify his own name that other nations around the world might hear of his mighty power and tremble at his mighty acts and that his own people might cling to him as their Lord and their God. Friend, as you know, it's going to be the same today. Oh, friends, what God did for his people in their suffering before they were delivered is similar to what he's going to do for you and me and his people around the world before we are soon delivered from this world. understand why the seven plagues and the national Sunday law are coming and why our mighty God in his great love and mercy is allowing this Roman Catholic attack on God's SDA church.
what liberation theology does is takes the viewpoint that um, <clears throat> the Antichrist and the beasts of Revelation mm -hmm. are not personal, hmm. or they are basically structures kind of thing that the traditional Adventist point of view uh -huh. of the Antichrist is shifted from the Roman Catholic Church uh -huh. to injustices in society. Oh. Um, to get the finger off of Rome. Right. And what it does is most that the religion teachers here teach that these uh, Babylon in Revelation does not refer to the papacy or Rome huh. in any way, shape, or form, but that it refers to social injustices such as racism, hmm. uh, sexism, um, diff all these uh, um, different kind of isms that... Uh, Wait a minute now. What you said was very shocking, if I comprehend what you just said. Were you just saying that Bible teachers at this university you're going to actually have told the, the students that the beast is not Rome, but is these isms? Is that what you're saying, that they're teaching? Yes. Well, it's, they don't, some teachers don't live limited to isms. But what they do is they shift the view off of the papacy and off Roman Catholicism to anything else. I see. And usually it is the isms. Now that but would that would please Rome, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Very much. Hmm. And when students object to this kind of teaching, uh -huh. um, they are often ridiculed. They're often called uh, extremist uh, troublemakers. Hmm. Um, in fact, to to object to this kind of teaching in a class is to defy the authority of the teacher and everything that he studied during his PhD and all uh. his uh, academic career. But the thing is, what you're telling me is these teachers are, are teaching the SDA students Roman Catholic teaching, and uh, I'm sure that none of these teachers have ever been to any Roman Catholic uh, schools, uh, so where would they get that from? Well. Actually, some of our teachers have been to Jesuit influence schools, and some of the schools are definitely uh, Jesuit schools. They have. Yes. Like what names? Them? Um, some of our teachers have been to the Pontifical Gregorian Institute to do their uh, doctoral studies or master studies in Rome. Yes. Huh. Some of our teachers have been to Boston University, uh, Claremont Theological Institute, or Theological Seminary to Fuller Seminary, um, Harvard, huh. uh, Cambridge. Um, uh, now, uh, do they? Yes. What's that? Chicago Divinity School. Yes, one of our teachers have been to Chicago Divinity Schools, and the interesting thing about this is, is that they make no excuses for saying in class that they have many Jesuit friends. Wait a minute now. Uh, you haven't heard them say in class that they have many Jesuit friends, have you? Yes, I have. You have? Yes. And these uh, are Adventist teachers in an yes, Adventist university? Yes, they are. Uh, teaching uh, uh, Roman Catholicism, going to Jesuit or Catholic schools, having Jesuit friends, does that sound like Catholicism to you? Yes, it does. It is Catholicism. Uh, now, we know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not the Roman Catholic Church, but we know that the Roman Catholic Church, according to Bible prophecy, Revelation 12:17, is attacking God's Seventh-day Adventist Church and all the institutions connected with it. Would you say that what you've just shared with us, as shocking as it is, is part of the great Roman Catholic attack on God's SDA Church. Yes, I would. Hmm. Uh, would you recommend <coughs> that uh, students or uh, SDA parents send their children to the very university that you go to? No, I would not. I would recommend them to send them elsewhere. Now, if they wanted a good Roman Catholic education, would you recommend that they send their children to the university where you attend? Yeah. If they wanted to learn Roman Catholicism, this would be a nice place to learn it. And this teacher told me point blank 
if you don't like the teaching here, don't go to Andrews because it's worse than it is here. Hmm. The teachers are more liberal. And, and basically, what are they teaching here? Roman Catholicism. Uh, you told me that the teachers are teaching the Jesuit teaching of liberation theology. You've told me that they've gone to Roman Catholic universities and colleges. Uh, you've told me that uh, they, he said that Jesus cannot come because they don't have solidarity, which is the homo, uh, uh, Roman Catholic movement. Uh, you've told me that they teach Roman Catholic teachings. The only thing left is uh, to some of them to be homosexual. And uh, certainly none of them are homosexual. The issue of homosexuality is advertised in uh, the Criterion, which is the school newspaper. Hmm. And when we as students protested and said that homosexuality is not a uh, biblical principle, we were ridiculed, we were called extremists and troublemakers because hmm. uh, they said that the Bible, the Bible did not support our view. Hmm. Who said that? Some Jesuits? Um, the president of the school, oh. uh, the, the student body president, uh, senators of the schools, the student body. Um, some of our teachers actively uh, wrote in the criterion against us. Uh, saying that we were nothing more than troublemakers and that we didn't have a loving spirit toward the homosexuals. Hmm. But we made it very clear that we love the sinners, but yes. we do not love the sin. Amen. And we believe that the Bible does not in any way, shape, or form accept homosexuality as a lifestyle. Yes. And when we pointed this out, they tried to ridicule us, tried to divert the issue from homosexuality to being being equal, having solidarity, yes. um, being inclusive, uh, these, basically they're all ideas wrapped up around solidarity. And when we said that by advertising for, um, I don't, do you want me to mention the, the publication, SDA Kinship? Sure, that's fine. By advertising for SDA Kinship, that kinship, we were... Kinship, that's homosexuals. Yes. Now who advertised for that? Well, the school newspaper did. Uh, this Adventist school? Yes, this Adventist school newspaper did. Huh. And uh, when we asked them to kindly remove the publications from future issues, um, they kind of ridiculed us and uh, told us that we were extreme. Mm -hmm. And we told them by supporting this kind of thing that uh, we are uh, basically accepting sin. Yes. Um, and the teachers, the faculty, administrative, uh, faculty as well as uh, students yeah. began to uh, try to ostracize us from the, uh, mm. the school here. Yes. Now, I want to I tell you something. I want to ask you something, really. Um, you'll notice in my programs, we deal with issues. We don't deal with people. God loves the dear people. Isn't that right? He loves, yes, he does. He loves all the people, atheists. Uh, people that hate him, he loves them. He loves the dear Roman Catholics. He loves all the people. Uh, no matter how they, even they murdered Jesus, he loved them. He wants to save them. And that's why we have this program to try to save people and help them and let them know God loves them. Um, and that's why I don't, I don't give names. I don't care about names. Uh, it doesn't matter. The main thing is, is uh, the issues, the principles, to obey God rather than man. To, to turn our eyes upon the lovely Jesus. Uh, I, but I want to ask you a question. Now, do you think, I'm going to leave it up to you, do you think that the people watching have a right to know what university that you attend? And if you do, then go ahead and tell us. La Sierra University. We were perplexed why they did not see clearly that by advertising for SDA kinship, uh -huh. that they were going against the Word of God. And we wondered why so many faculty, so many uh, students, and so many administration uh -huh. had supported SDA kinship uh -huh. through publications and uh, out openly in their churches. And we wondered why until we started doing some investigating um, and
and talking to different uh, students and faculty who chose to name anonymous, remain anonymous. Yeah. We found out that a good number of a of our South Sioux representatives were in fact engaging in homosexual activity. Hmm. We found that they were engaging in sexual pervertedness. We found that they were having sexual relations with each other hmm. in the South Sioux office. Uh, now, when we did some further investigating, we found out that some of the homosexuals in this area were kids of, or children of, South, uh, of conference officials. Hmm. Uh, they were sons and basically mostly sons, sons of uh, Southeastern Conference officials, and which is why they allowed this kind of thing to go on. Uh, who allowed it? Um, the faculty, the I conference see. level. When we appealed to the conference level, huh. um, could that also we um, we found out that a couple of the pastors had been invited by SDA kinship uh -huh. to become pastors of homosexual churches. Uh -huh and that they had strong ties with SDA kinship. Huh. And that kind of bothered us, and, but we realize now why they did vote against removing the advertisement for SDA kinship. Yes, you can see if the children of the... And when we um, went to our dean to discuss some of these issues with them, um, we talked to him about some of the teachings that um, the teachers taught here. Uh -huh. He kind of dismissed us as troublemakers, as mm. infantile, called us religiously immature. Mm. Infantile. And told us that uh, that we need to open our minds up to what was being taught and stop being so narrow-minded. Mm. And we explained to him that what we wanted was we want to learn Adventism at this school. Yes. But that we were getting nothing or everything but Adventism. And he said that this church has had enough of Adventism and that what we need to learn is expand our minds to other beliefs and other ideas. Like Catholicism. Like Catholicism. Amazing. Actually, now that, that would blow you away, wouldn't it? Actually, one teacher told us that we have nothing to fear from the Jesuits because they are not the super Catholics like we believe, hmm. but that uh, they are the left wing of the Catholic Church who nobody pays attention to. Hmm. Well, while nobody's paying attention to them, they're doing their work. We are invited by the teachers to visit different Sunday-keeping churches and actually attend services and participate, hmm. that we have much to learn from these people. Yes, you sure do. You have to learn how to worship the beast. If they came here, what do you think or have you seen what happened to them? I've seen students get caught up in uh, the heretical limbo. Mm. Um, these were once devout Seventh-day Adventists, but as they got mm. to know the administration better, they later began to resemble them. Mm. It's just by far. beholding your change in right. the same image. Exactly. Their ideology began to change as well. Mm. Just think how their poor parents must have felt, that heart anguish. I don't think their parents know. Hmm. And that's a sad thing. Parents send their children here thinking they're getting a Seventh-day Adventist education, hmm. or even a biblical education, uh -huh. but they're not getting that here. The ecumenical movement is what's going on here in this school. Uh, now, we know that that's a Roman Catholic movement. Yes. Uh -huh. In fact, it originated from the Roman Catholics yes. as a result of Vatican II. That's right. Uh, this particular um, teacher is the campus chaplain as well. That guy right on the bottom? Yes. My, uh, my dear wife said she went to school with him. Yes, she did. Huh. Now, what he has to say about Adventist eschatology is that as we enter into the 20th century, uh -huh. we need to get rid of our 19th century eschatology. In other words, throughout the spirit of prophecy? Exactly. Mm. And not so much the spirit of prophecy alone, Yes. But also biblical, faithful biblical interpretation altogether. Upon which our church is founded. Yes. Hmm. This is a publication that they put out here at the school every now and then. Uh -huh. And what I want to talk about is the new school emblem. Okay. Okay. 
this is the new school emblem for La Sierra. Huh. Uh, when it's split with Loma Linda... What kind of cross is that? That is... Um, is that a Maltese cross? Yes, it's a Maltese cross. Uh. This cross was utilized by the by the Nazi Germany army. Huh. Here's uh, the side binding of the book that I copied it from. History of the German General Staff. Uh -huh, there's well, there's a Maltese cross. Right, the same cross there. Now, uh, we're, I'm just wondering, uh, where did that cross originally come from, and was it ever have anything to do with Rome? Yes, in fact, it originated in Rome. Hmm. Uh, here, here's another picture that I thought was very interesting. Oh. Here is Hitler. Uh -huh. with some of his generals, uh -huh. and if you can see, they're all wearing the Maltese cross. Interesting. Now, that's given to officers. Now, do you think Hitler ever saw that in a Roman Catholic church? Yes, as well as the swastika. Huh. What you're about to see is a small ad that used to be in the school criterion newspaper. In the school paper, and where is it now? Okay. Uh, it's no longer in the school newspaper, but they still advertise it. Uh -huh. sure. And where are you standing now? I'm standing in uh, Palmer Hall, which is the School of Science. In what school? La Sierra University. Oh, I see. And so what are we going to see now? What you're going to see is the ad that used to be in there, but now they pin it up on a billboard. So people in the walking in the hall can see it? Yes. And it's, oh. it's clear. It's right here. This particular ad was in is a brand new case. Uh -huh. uh, we found that whenever we saw the ads, we would take them down. Uh -huh. But every time we took them down, they would put another one back up. Uh -huh. So finally what they did was they added this case and they put it in this uh, case under a lock and key. Oh, I see. So now we can't take it down. Oh, I see. Well, I guess they wanted it up then, didn't they? Here we have uh, a non-Adventist Pentecostal group uh, by the name of Vineyard. Vineyard Fellowship. Vineyard Fellowship. And what they have here is uh, they rent, our school rents out a chapel on campus uh -huh. okay, on Sunday evening uh -huh. to La Sierra, I mean to Vineyard. Huh, they're Pentecostals, aren't they? Yes, in fact. A friend of mine went into their service one time, and he told me they were speaking in tongues hmm. and prophesying and interpreting. On campus here? On campus, hmm. as well as healing. Well, do, do the teachers here warn the Adventist students not to go? Uh, I encourage you to go. Huh. In fact, I've read in some books written by Adventist teachers here at this school, uh -huh. which say not only do you, should you go to an Adventist church on Sabbath, uh -huh. but you should also join and participate as a member in a Sunday-keeping church as Amazing. well. Amazing. Mm. Well, that's really something, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, what's going to keep these poor people uh, going this direction for so long from, go from going along with the Sunday-keepers when the Sunday law comes and receiving the mark of the beast and ending up in the fire of hell? What's going to keep them from it? I don't think there'll be anything that will keep them from it. Oh, friend, our kind Heavenly Father has warned us of Rome's great attack. And from things going on all around us, we can truly see it. Those of you who have not seen my first 12-part series may not always be able to see the connection between what is happening and the great attack of Rome. To those, I would recommend watching that first series that I've made called Catholic Charismatic Attack on God's SDA Church. I also expose this attack and what's happening leading to the soon coming National Sunday Law on my monthly letter, which I send all over the world to many thousands of people. Uh, this law is coming as churches unite amid the chaos and horrors of our times. If you'd like to receive that free monthly letter, you may call this number, 
618-627-2357. And you will be updated with thousands around the world learning things happening, leading to this law that the devil has planned to put God's people to death. But friend, even people of the world who don't know what we know as Seventh-day Adventists, with the advantages of the spirit of prophecy, have indeed been aware of this attack. As we see by these books at, that you're seeing right now, that I'm showing you amazing books, Keys of This Blood by the Vatican Insider, Malachi Martin, and these other books that you are seeing that expose what Rome has been doing around this world. God's people have been aware for a long time of this Roman Catholic attack, as may be seen in this journal published from 1909 to 1915 by the Review and Herald and sponsored by the General Conference. This hard-hitting, powerful journal is entitled Protestant Magazine. Amazing. You know, it's interesting also to note that this journal was discontinued soon after the death of Ellen White. Yes, friend, the prophet of God was right concerning Rome's attack when she said, quote, Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty, unquote. That was great controversy, 566. And remember, friend, that the same kind prophet of God told us that when we expose the workings of Rome and the man of sin to be so kind and so sweet with the love of the lovely Jesus, so that the people's hearts will be one so that they'll come out of Rome, out of her daughters, and join with God's commandment-keeping people. Friends, after seeing 24 hours of the church would fragment without a church manual. And in this, it guides a church when it has its election. It guides the church if there are problems out there that need to be dealt with as far as a member or even a church congregation. And again, to have the sisterhood of churches all united together, a church manual will always be necessary. the manual updated is ongoing work of a committee between GC sessions. Some of the suggested changes this year include extending the term of office of local church officers to two years rather than one, and changing the wording of the baptismal vows to include language about soul winning. Other changes include specific instructions concerning disfellowship. That's not to happen to a church member until that member is visited by the pastor or a designated member of the church board.
After seeing 24 hours on the video series Catholic Charismatic Attack and then seeing this program, someone might wonder if by this time the Roman Catholic Attack has now been completely exposed by this program. Friend, I can truly say that you have seen absolutely nothing. According to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and what we see going on all around us, the attack is so vast, so worldwide, so deep laid that Rome is attacking peoples and kindreds and tongues and nations and religions and organizations and denominations and institutions and colleges and schools and governments and companies and businesses and churches and television, radio, newspapers, books, libraries, music, real estate, insurance companies, grocery chains, mafia, publishing houses, industries, movie production, agriculture, and slaves and souls of men. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 18, 23 and 24. Oh friend, after all of that, is anyone still asking if Rome is attacking God's SDA church? Get ready for a shock. Welcome to Bible Jeopardy. Our contestants today are Ken Velveeta and Sister Ann Klein. Sister Ann from the convent of the Really Happy Sisters has been on a winning streak this week with a total of $24,300. Welcome back, Sister. And Ken, this is your first time with us here on the game. You're a biological engineer, husband, yes, and father of four. That's right. And it says here to be sure and mention the fact that you are extremely careful about your body because it's the temple of God. That's right, Alex. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Quality of lifestyle just gives me an edge. Mm, okay. Well, Ken, I'm sure you'll be happy to know that, well, it's not quality of lifestyle, but quality of life. It's one of our categories here on today's show. So let's begin this round with you, Ken. Okay. I'll take quality of life for 100. Quality of life for 100. This biblical practice was key in the lives of all great men and women of God. Ken, what is vegetarianism? No, I'm sorry. Sister? What is faith? Yes. Sister? Quality of life for 200, Alex. Quality of life for 200. The Bible says people who are filled with this can exhibit unusual behavior. Ken, what is wine? No, I'm sorry, Ken. Sister? What is the Holy Spirit? Good. Sister? Quality of life for 300, Alex. The regular practice of this, according to the Bible, makes for successful Christian living. Ken, you're first again. What is keeping of the Sabbath? No, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Ken. Uh, sister, you want to give this one a try? What is prayer? Yes. Last question before we go to final Bible Jeopardy. Sister, it's yours again. Quality of life for 400? He is known simply as a great healer and... Ken, well, I wasn't finished with the statement, but go ahead, give it a try. Who is Jesus Christ? No, I'm sorry. The rest reads... He is known simply as a great healer and started the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. Sister? Who is John Harvey Kellogg? Yes. I that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Ken, with that quality of lifestyle edge, ends this round at minus $1,000. And Sister Anne, from the convent of the really, really, really happy sisters, Sister, your winnings stand at $25,300. Now, don't go away, folks. We'll be right back with more Bible Jeopardy after these messages from our sponsors. 
O oh, friend, the prophet of God cries out, quote, The papal church will never relinquish her claim to infallibility. The Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people of our land need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. O oh, friend, the prophet of God cries out again, quote, Popery is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Unquote. For Spirit of Prophecy 388, it is not without reason that the claim has been put forth that Catholicism is now almost like Protestantism. There has been a change, but the change is in Protestants, not in Romanists. Catholicism, indeed, resembles the Protestantism that now exists, but it is far removed from Protestantism as it was in the days of Cranmer, Ridley, Knox, and other reformers. As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil, and as the inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. 4 SP, page 388. Oh, friend, this is why I'm going to say that anyone that gets a thousand of the National Sunday Law books to reach about 3,000 souls before time has run out will receive them for a donation of 39 cents each with free shipping to anyone addressed in the Continental United States. Friend, time is fast running out. May God help us reach the dear people is my prayer. Oh, friend, you've seen the horrors of what has been going on in this great Catholic charismatic attack. You've seen early in this program the reasons why our kind Heavenly Father is allowing these things to happen. But now I ask the question, what will be the end of these things? Will Rome triumph, as is predicted in the book Keys of This Blood, by the Vatican Insider? Uh, will truth be pushed down by Rome and fall into the abyss? Will God's people be scattered to the wind and come to nothing? Will truth finally triumph forever? Will God's 6,000-year-old Seventh-day Adventist church be absorbed into Rome as Malachi Martin predicted? Will it be taken to heaven without one building, without one pope, without one president, without one headquarters, without one hypocrite, without one spot, or without one wrinkle? Listen now to what God's prophet has to say about this very thing in Acts of the Apostles, 599 to 602, I quote, As Christ sent forth his disciples, so today he sends forth the members of his church. The same power that the apostles had is for them. Christ has given to the church a sacred charge. There is nothing that the Savior desires so much as agents who will represent to the world his spirit and his character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christ. The church is God's agency for the proclamation of truth, empowered by him to do a special work. Finally, friend, here is what will happen. Watch closely. Quote, there will dwell within her the excellency of divine grace. There is no power 
that can stand against her. There is before her the dawn of a bright and glorious day. Truth, passing by those who despise it and reject it, will triumph. Although at times apparently retarded, its progress has never been checked. When the message of God meets with opposition, he gives it additional force that it may exert greater influence. Endowed with divine energy, it will cut its way through the strongest barriers and triumph over every obstacle. What sustained the Son of God during his life of toil and sacrifice? Looking into eternity, he beheld the happiness of those who through his humiliation have received pardon and everlasting life. His ear caught the shout of the redeemed. He heard the ransomed ones singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. By faith, we may stand on the threshold of the eternal city and hear the gracious welcome given to those who in this life cooperate with Christ, regarding it as an honor to suffer for his sake. The conflict is over. Tribulation and strife are at an end. Songs of victory will fill all heaven as the redeemed ones, the ransomed ones, take up the joyful strain. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Praise God, friend. Praise God.